It's time to talk movies. Television and online. It's time for Screen. On screen, Joel Jackson on his starring role in Channel 7's Peter Allen, Not the Boy Next Door. It was daunting. And knowing how much success that it afforded Todd McKinney and Hugh Jackman. A box office hit in the US, straight out of Compton. Speak a little truth and people lose their mind. And Rob Sitch on what happens when dreams collide with bureaucracy in the ABC comedy Utopia. You know the old game of rock beats scissors is mar marginal seat beats infrastructure. And a warm welcome back to our web commentator, Tegan Higginbotham. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. Oh, it's really great to have you back. Now, before we get started on the show proper, there were a couple of films that were released while we were on our break that deserve our attention. One of them, Graham, is holding the man, Neil Armfield's direction of Tim Conagrave's memoir. It became a very popular play and is now a most heart-wrenching film. Uh, it's about the love affair between Tim and John Callio, and they met at school. One was a thespian, the other one was a footy player. It's a very, very affecting piece of work, I must say, but it's been somewhat controversially received in some areas, and I can see why up to a point too, because there are some problems with it that, that I found that the time lapses were a bit peculiar at, at, at different points, and uh, I never quite saw or understood what they saw in each other. Oh, I, I, I sort of totally believed this film mm. from the, the very moment it started. The start actually lost me slightly. It took me a few moments to recover because it's, there's a whole lot of uh, AFL football being played and uh, it's not played very well. And in fact, it looks much more like rugby union or rugby league. <laughs> All this running for marks that uh, would never happen in a, a real game. That lost me uh, slightly, uh, I All have right. to, to say. Well, despite the footy, <laughs> how many stars would you give Holding the Man? I'd give it three and a half. You see, I'm giving it four and a half. Mm. I absolutely embraced it. Now, the other one is Joel Edgerton's uh, debut director. Oh, uh, yes. Direction. That's He's a different kettle of fish altogether, isn't it? That's a very, very superior uh, and beautifully conceived, very sensitively uh, directed uh, thriller. And at times it's quite shocking, isn't it? Well, it's, it's so original in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, those creepy thrillers, like Basic Instinct, you know, yes, with this... Uh, but the, ca the moment it opens with that camera creeping down the mm. corridor, it's sort of like it's so beautifully directed. What, what amazing casting of Jason Bateman uh, as the husband. It's such a different role for him. He's no, so known for his comic roles. Uh, I thought, I'm, I'm so impressed. What are you giving this one? I'm giving this four. I thought this was an absolutely superlative piece of work from Joel Edgerton, yeah. who really marks himself now as a, as a director of the, you know, of oh, the top caliber. I think caliber. that's where he wants to go. I think well, he, he wants will. to go And he's a terrific actor, too, because and, this is not a very it. sympathetic part. It's, yeah, I think it's wonderful, too. It's mm -hmm. four stars from me. Great work. It's time to get on to what's happening on our TV screens now. Channel 7's new series, Peter Allen, Not the Boy Next Door, is the story of how an Aussie boy from the bush, played by newcomer Kai Baldwin, went from singing in school shows and neighbourhood pubs in country New South Wales and became an international star. When my baby, when my baby smiles at me, I go to Rio. Joel Jackson stars as the adult Peter Allen, Rebecca Gibney as his encouraging mother, and Sigrid Thornton as Judy Garland, who discovered him in 1964 when he was performing in a trio at the Hong Kong Hilton. The first episode is the story of an impossible marriage between Peter Allen and Liza Minnelli at a time when overt homosexuality was simply not tolerated on stage or in society. I'm not interested in any boy from Austria. She's dying to talk to you. But I turn into a Mama might be right about you. We're gonna get married. Joel, it is great to welcome you back in our studio, and particularly for this role of Peter Allen. I mean, how was that, taking on the role of this icon that we all know so well? It was, it was daunting, and knowing how much success that it afforded Todd McKenney and Hugh Jackman and 
those kind of things. Um, but for me, it was more of uh, learning to dance and getting his vocal range. Did you listen to a lot? Of his songs? Yeah. All of them. All of them. I still find myself listening to ones I've never heard before. He had an immense catalogue. Well, the production really has itself as, as an overall sort of concept. The same kind of energy that a, a Peter Allen concert uh, had. It's an extraordinarily energetic production. You must have been mesmerised at every moment, wondering what, what you were doing next, with yeah. up to three, four cameras going. And uh, yeah. how, how did you keep track of the whole thing? Yeah, I, I do... Um... It was a thing I learned from hearing about a Mel Gibson story where he'd mark out scenes and he'd mark the world of the play and, or the, the film but then order it in the, the shoot order. So I kind of mentally was prepared for that but emotionally and physically once you were on the day you didn't know what was going to happen to you and you just had to meet it with both feet on the ground and kind of accept. But... And you've got Sean Seat directing too who's yes. most famous most probably because of the code. Uh, and I think it's been really beautifully brought together. Uh, I ended up bawling my eyes out. Mm. And this is the only ep yeah, one. Wait till episode two. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Was there ever a thought that you would just mime to no. the real Peter no. Allen? You were no. always going to sing. I don't know if the production knew just how well I could sing. I mean, they knew during the audition process I could sing the selected songs. But as soon as I got the part, I went and learnt most of his catalogue in prep of whatever I'd be called upon mm. to do. So the first two weeks of rehearsal, I went in and sang what I knew and what I'd had done in the script. And with Ashley, I went in front of the producers and they just went, OK, well, let's, you've been fighting for it and asking for it. Let him sing. Somewhere over the rainbow We are high And I then fought later on in the shoot to get live ballads. So Tenerfield Sadler and um, Estrella de Home and and really work for the sequences where, as a singer and songwriter that he was, you can reach into that heart of Peter yeah. Allen and mm. see his emotional conflicts, just like you would um, a live performance of a singer-songwriter or like you do in musical theatre. It goes past the words. It's the imagery and that, that whole aura of the man. It, it mesmerised me, and I think it's going to mesmerise our audience. Before you got the role, just before you got the role, and really wanting it, what's that like? There's nothing like it. It's like panning for gold, all those guys that, you know, you hear stories about just artists who went for, for days painting on a blank canvas or whatever. You come up with so many ideas and, and you don't know what's going to be the right one. You've just got to go with everything you've got on that day and hope that it works out and listen. And It's a ride and that's why we do it and I love it. Like, well, it's an incredible ride you take us on in this series. Thanks for joining us. No, thanks for having me. And so let's take another look at Peter Allen, not the boy next door. I'm not one of those people born to be a star. Now you listen to me. You are not second rate. And you never have been. Well, just what do you say about this production and this extraordinary performance? I, I watched this uh, on a TV screen or a computer screen in the, the office at the Australian newspaper and I had tears in my eyes. I started dancing at the desk. I jumped up at different times cheering. It was Gosh, all a bit over the top. You're sometimes. So, well, well, that's what this kind of thing can do to a television critic. I think it's the most extraordinary performance from mm. Joel. But I think they're all good. I think Siggy Thornton's fabulous. She is. Like, Sarah West as Liza Minnelli. Yes. Rebecca Gibney is so such a stoic in, yes. in this industry. Uh, but not only that, I really like Sean Seat's direction. I, I, the music is so evocative. Mm. And I, I want to be affected by the stuff I watch. I want to cry. Well, this is certainly you know? affecting at every single level. And it's highly intelligent and very, very clever piece of production. Channel 7 ought to be enormously congratulated, I think. And what about young Kai Baldwin? Oh, terrific As the young Peter. How good is he? Oh. The dance sequence, the singing sequences in the pub, yeah. it's just absolutely terrific. And the duets he sings with the, the older Peter Allen are very, yes. very Poignant. affecting. They're just terrific. Yeah, but it's almost like you forget that he started as the Allen brothers. Yes. You forget Chris Allen. The funniest yeah. scene, one of the funniest scenes early on is where um, the uh, young Peter Allen is kind of corralled into becoming an Allen brother because yes. he's very flamboyant <laughs> and he eventually has to become terribly yes. stiff so he can sing like a, an Allen brother. That's very, very funny. But so much of it's terribly funny, terribly comic, as well as being very, very poignant and, and genuinely, you know, heartwarming, I yeah, well, think. And it's celebrating one of this country's, you know, musical icons, really. Mm. He was extraordinary. I'm giving this four and a half stars. I'll give you four and a half as well. It's just absolutely so classy.
now to a film that looks at the racial politics of the mid-1980s through the music of gangster rappers in W.A. Straight Outta Compton opens in the ghettos of L.A. as Easy e played by newcomer Jason Mitchell, risks his life in a drug deal that goes terribly wrong. After Easy e joins rappers Dr. Dre, Corey Hawkins and Ice Cube, played by his son O'Shea Jackson Jr., the group is taken under the wing of record producer Jerry Heller, played by Paul Jamat. What's NWA stand for anyway? No whites allowed? Something like that? <laughs> no. Niggas with attitudes. But as their stardom rises, so do the tensions within the band and with the FBI, who take issue with some of the group's lyrics. Performers of the song F the police will not be permitted. They try to tell us what the fuck we can't put. This is WA. Yo, Dre. What up? I got something to say. Well, this really knocked me around a bit, this film. I've got to say, I didn't know much about Gangster Rap. No. It kind of passed me by, given the, the vast age <laughs> group differences. But I, I went through it with my kids. Oh, did you really? And all that rap music. Mm. Oh, that... Well, I didn't know that NWA actually meant niggers whiz <laughs> attitude. That was kind of even <laughs> new to, uh, to me. But this, this is a very urgent film, isn't it? It's a film that kind of transcends its, its origins and its, its reality, I suppose, is a biopic and draws a straight line between the, the police brutality and the violence of the social conditions that formed that music, yes. that, uh, that propelled that exactly. music, drawing a straight line right through to the, 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 the police shootings that are still happening on American streets today. Yeah. It's uh, no wonder that music connected. It was, it was like a catalyst uh, for so many African Americans. Uh, I actually thought it was a great insight into an era that I didn't know all that much no. about. Uh, I think the performances are great, and I think F. Gary Gray's direction was, was terrific in this. It's pretty good, given that he hadn't actually directed a great deal before, except for, I gather, quite a few video clips for yes. all those guys. Yeah. Um, it's also interesting, I think, the thing, because it, it's put together, it's produced by, by some of the, uh, the surviving group um, and the widow of one. Uh, it's a little hagiographic at times. It's a little misogynistic, as you'd probably expect from all of these people, but it has such, such a purchase on reality, and it's just so strong. You, you actually feel you're there, uh, part of the conditions that create this music, and that's, that's rare in a biopic. Also, this, the excesses that they got into after they were successful, they had all this money, uh, it's wine, women and song and drugs and There's anything else they can... There's a lot of going on. Yeah. You know, so it, that, that, that world, you know, that they suddenly had access to, the world of wealth and excess, yeah. uh, I thought was really interesting and that's where everything starts to fray, where there is money around and... Yes. The film you know, made, maybe itself frays slightly in the last half hour as money becomes an issue. There's lots of arguments about contracts and money and who's getting what and so on. That can be a little bit boring, a little bit tedious in films, I think. Yeah, uh, but it's, it's, you know, who do the lyrics be, be, belong to? Who does the music belong to? And well, I mean, yes, it, interesting I, I, arguments. Yeah. I, I, that's, that's part of life in the music world mm. these days, I would have thought. Look, I'm giving this four stars. I'm I thought it, it was four. Four as well. I thought it was, I was absolutely knocked out with it. Got to say, I, I was singing those songs for days. <laughs> While NWA have been widely credited with giving disenfranchised African-American men a voice, yeah. they've been criticised quite heavily for their portrayal and treatment of women. That is so true. Yeah. Well, we saw it in the film, mm. actually. Yeah, quite a lot of it. So that's why I'm really happy now to talk about Issa Rae, who's giving nerdy African-American women a very big voice. Issa Rae has created a hit online web series called Awkward Black Girl, where she stars as Jay, a self-doubting, freestyle-rapping call centre employee who finds every way to make the, the simplest social interactions deeply uncomfortable. Standing alone at parties is the clearest indication that nobody wants you. Should I try to make friends? Do I need to act like I'm having a great time? Are people looking at me? Maybe if I dance next to this guy, he'll recognize his urge to dance with me. Oh. 
Now, as you can see, that first series, like, there's no budget there. There's absolutely no money behind it. But I can see why it's gone viral online. And the second series actually garnered attention from Pharrell Williams, who does yeah. Blurred Lines and Happy. And the second series was much better quality. But I find the whole thing just really honest, just really self-deprecating and, and quite fresh. It's a very fresh take on things. I found mm. it agonising. Really? <laughs> Painful. Oh, I felt so much for her. I just... You know, yeah, I, 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 I was so familiar with so much of her anxiety and the, the monologues just going through everything so much in her own head. Yes. Like, I but really... I'm, I was anxious because, you know, I dance like that. <laughs> <laughs> it really worried me. I so... know. I mean, she's a real person. This she is what is. I love. There's a real honesty and in it's very stylish in its own way. I think it wants that with more production values. It was so just clear, so oh, clear in what it had tacky, to say. it's pretty tacky, I think. Do you think so? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I do, it, it did need a little bit more money, but what's interesting is that a few networks were interested in it. Good. But um, they actually wanted to change the lead into somebody with lighter skin, longer no. hair. Oh, no. I know. No. Well, after the break, Twilight star Robert Pattinson in a very different role as a magnum photographer who befriends James Dean. And Rob Sitch, writer, director and lead actor of the ABC sitcom Utopia. Welcome back. Later in the program, we'll take a look at Mr. Robot, a US drama series that's ready for you to binge on right now. But first to the ABC comedy series Utopia. Nation building is flourishing, major infrastructure projects are underway, but back in the office the internet still doesn't work. Health and safety rules, and the meetings just get bigger. The new series of Utopia follows on from the office failures of the previous year, and Tony, played by Rob Sitch, is keen to focus on a huge Darwin project, which is tantalisingly close to being signed off. But yet again the bureaucracy intervenes and priorities shift. Jim Gibson, played by Anthony Lehman, is the interface between the authority and the government, and his arrival always brings problems. You wanted to see me? You wanted to see me. Did I? Yeah, and you're early. So, what's his problem? I told you yesterday, we solved the problems. Really? Yeah. No, it's just that I was chatting to someone in Treasury. Why are you ringing Treasury? Yeah, it was about something else, sort of mentioned Badgeries Creek in passing, and that you guys were having a bit of strife. But we're not. You said something about terminal problem. No, I said there'd be an air freight terminal. <sighs> I must have just heard terminal. Yes. And it's really exciting to be able to welcome Rob Sitch to our studio. Rob, welcome. Thanks, Margaret. I'm interested in writing of this show. You direct it, you star in it. I mean, it's an enormous load. How long does it take to write a series like this? Because you co-write with Tom Gleisner and Santo Chilario, don't you? We do. It took us a couple of years to learn what the show was and we experimented with a lot. So the second series was sort of maybe nine months a year, but it's, it's enjoyable because people will say things that we follow up on. We were talking to someone at the ABC who said, we were asking about his, you know, his new high-powered job and he said, oh, workplace health and safety is driving me mad. <laughs> and it seems such a funny thing to say, so we followed it up and... And, it's, and that sort of little bit of madness is, is all we need. The show seems to be built around this particular trick, doesn't it, really, of the uh, contrast, the tension, really, the comic tension between the, the dreams that governments have of infrastructure and the, the realities of a politically correct office. It is. It's, um, you know, the old game of rock beats scissors <laughs> is mar marginal seat beats infrastructure. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we... <laughs> even the funny things, we, were, we did an episode on Badgeries Creek because... Um, we ran into a former politician from Queensland. He said, oh, have you heard about that international airport a guy built on his farm? <laughs> and he did it in 18 months. And it's one of those things you think, that can't be true. And, of course, it is. I was really curious to know whether you are inspired by Yes Minister. Yes Minister and Yes Prime Minister is my favourite show of all time. And, and I remember that because when I was 17, my older brother recommended it to me and I said... I think the phrase was, you've got to be effing kidding me. I'm going to watch a show about politics. What are you proposing to do? I shall appoint someone. And when did you take this momentous decision? Today, when I read the papers. But when did you first think of it? Today, when I read the papers. <laughs> One of the things I love about it, whenever I watch it, is, is this curious balance of substance, fantastic characters, and it's really quite silly. And 
One of the things that I thought we'd do in Utopia, as I kept reminding all the others, is let's keep throwing in silly things because, you know, that's what happens in real life. It's amazing if you, if you keep your radar up, how many ridiculously silly things you, you do in, 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 a, in a given week. Rob, it's, it strikes me that underneath all the silliness and the fun, there's serious intent in this. I think marketing is, is winning the battle. And I said a bunch of times that I think if you've got a bad policy with a good slogan, you're better off than a great policy with a terrible slogan. And, and I reckon that pe the use of words has almost got scientific now. And so it's sort of, it's up to, I don't know, people like me and groups like us to actually have a counter, counter, counterfactual or counter language to it. Rob Sitch, thanks very much for joining us and uh, let's just hope the show keeps rating and let's uh, keep hoping that uh, life keeps following art in this case. Thanks very thanks, much, Rob. Ray. Thanks, Ray. Thanks, Margaret. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, really let's fabulous. have another look at a clip from Utopia. It's a 90 minute drive from the city. It didn't take us long. Yeah, that's because we came in that. Big smiles. Think of all the things the NBA has achieved. Snap. Game over. Who won? I don't even know what game we're playing. It's so great seeing these guys continue that tradition of very clever satire, isn't it? They are, yeah, absolutely so, and they are just so clever. This is, as Rob Sitch said, the most beautifully fine-tuned yeah. piece of almost musical comedy. I mean, I've been watching them for years, you know, that groundbreaking series mm. Frontline so many years ago. Uh, and I mean, they're continuing that really clever, precise uh, comedy that has real bite to it. And it's interesting too that the Sitch character has hardly changed in all that time. He's always been the bemused, put upon, knocked around little character. And I asked him about this recently uh, when I was writing about him and uh, he said, well, he, it doesn't worry him in the slightest. He said, it's, he, uh, he said it's a bit like Barry Humphreys. There's nothing really you think that Barry Humphreys could have to say that wouldn't be said through the mouth of, of Dame Edna. And yeah. uh, Rob feels that, I think, very much about this character. Well, he knows created. him well. He knows him extremely well, doesn't he? Uh, I would give this series for an and a half stars, without a doubt. I'm going to go just a touch farther. I don't think you could even do anything better than this, the way it is at the moment. I'm actually going to say it's a, it's a fiver for me. Wow. It's very good. Now to Mr Robot, a TV series available on the streaming service Presto. In Mr Robot, Elliot Anderson, played by Rami Malek, is something of a modern-day Sherlock Holmes tracking down information in the fight against the criminals. Elliot's employed as a cyber security consultant and he uses his detective skills online to pry into secrets to protect his friends and confidants. He's also addicted to morphine. His relationships at All Safe Cyber Security are dysfunctional. He hates Facebook and social media and he sees his major client, E Corp, as Evil Corp. When All Safe is attacked online, Elliot saves the company but has sent messages from the hackers known as F Society, who try to recruit him. His life is turned upside down after he meets Mr Robot, played by Christian Slater, a tech anarchist who wants Elliot to work with him. You were testing me. You said there was a project. That'll come later. I just wanted you to see the place. I think this is a fantastic series. Mm. I think the character of Elliot is so interesting, you know, because he's got these skills that he uses to help his friends. He's so... Not that he's got many friends, he's because he's so alienated. He lives totally I inside mean, his head. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he's um, a socially crippled creature. Mm. I mean, what is this? All of a sudden we're seeing these main characters in television series, like Homeland. Mm. Uh, and now Mr Robot, where, you know, you've got this character who is so deeply flawed, but with these enormous skills. And it's tense, and I love Christian Slater. At the He's very, best, very good in it, yes. Best of times. And, yeah. uh, no, I, I'm, I'm totally hooked on this. I was really upset that I could only get to Ep 7. Oh, you're not that far ahead. Well, you're far ahead. three far. to go. You're ahead of me. No, I'm, I'm an addictive personality. <laughs> <laughs> so once I start on something that's as mm. good as this, 
I just want to keep going. I love the kind of rip from the headlines uh, quality of it, which was given more immediacy in a way by the um, the violation of the infidelity uh, website. Um, I have to check it here, called Ashley Madison. That's yes. right. Uh, I wasn't on it, Margaret. <laughs> but you just sort of wondered, I mean, if people hack these sort of sites and then possibly cause suicides, destroy people's lives, what should we really feel about them? What really is, in the end, the morality of this kind of hacking? This show raises so many absolutely wonderful oh, yeah, questions. And... Yes, it does. But, I mean, the, the, the thing that he is doing and that if society is trying to do is really um, disrupt capitalism and yes. the capitalist society and evil corp. And he doesn't call them evil corp for nothing because no, they doesn't. are pretty mm. disgusting. Look, I'm tempted to give it four and a half stars. I'm very tempted. Well, I'm going to give it four and a half stars. I think this is, this is possibly the best pilot yeah. I've watched since the pilot for The Walking Dead, which is one of the all-time great TV pilots. This is, this is sensational TV. Tegan, Utopia proves there's an audience out there for really well-written comedy. There really is. Mm. What's out there on the net? I found something really good. In fact, I think it might be the favourite thing that I've brought to the show so far. Fragments of Friday is a painfully good Australian comedy web series about three 20-something friends. Alex, played by director and writer Casey Anning, Sophie, Sarah Armanius and Maddie, Madeline Jones, piecing together the fragments of their drunken and often destructive Friday nights. I think that I brought a cab driver home. That's why you kept yelling maxi taxi. Do you remember this? Is the Pope a Buddhist? Isn't Xanax amazing? I say that you, uh, you drugged us. I do it all the time. You guys think you're just alcoholics, but you're actually a little bit addicted to pharmaceuticals. Oh. <laughs> they're all um, series one and two. They were released at the same time in August and they're all free online now, so I, I recommend watching them. They're great. Were they morning after pill she was gobbling in that early? Yeah. <laughs> just that. But I didn't realise that's what you were bringing and I've actually caught some of these. That's and funny. I think she is an amazing talent. Mm. She's really Casey good. Anne. The no. writing is so sharp. It's I so love funny. this series. Yeah. Tegan, thanks so much for that. Thank you for having me. Yes, thank you, Tegan. Great show. And thank you for joining us on screen. Yes, and we'll see you next week. See you then. See you then.